If you have your Bibles, please open with uh, me to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. And please rise as we read the entirety of Jonah 4 here. This comes right after the revival in Nineveh as Jonah proclaimed, the people believed, and they repented. And this is what happened next. Starting with verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, while I was still home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God. You're slow to anger, abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade. He waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah and give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy with the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Although you did not tend it, you did not make it grow. It sprang up overnight. It died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? May God bless this reading of his word today, given from him to you and your hearing. Please have a seat. I am married, and I have four kids. Ergo, I have not won an argument since 2003. <laughs> That's my great confession today. But I've realized that like 95% of the time, arguments that we have are pointless. They are just utterly pointless. They're usually one of two things that cause arguments. Either it's somebody venting emotions as somebody else, or miscommunication that gets out of control and we just need to simmer down. 95% of time, pointless arguments arise. There's a whole website that was devoted to couples sharing the most pointless fights that they had ever gotten in. And I, I loved these. I cherry-picked a couple to share with you. Once there was a, a couple, boyfriend, girlfriend, and they took a Sunday afternoon drive into the countryside. They're just enjoying the scenery. And as they're looking at all the farms and the hills, the girlfriend started singing. She said, the hills are alive with the sound of... And she stopped and looked at her boyfriend. Her boyfriend said later, he wrote this down, he said, I never heard, never watched the sound of music, had no idea what she was singing. So I just said, the sound of cows. <laughs> And she thought I was calling her a cow and started yelling at him the rest of the way home. Pointless arguments. Another couple said that they had a massive weekend blowout. They stopped talking to each other for the rest of the weekend because they couldn't agree where the top of the toe was. Whether it was the toenail was the top or the part that touches the shoe was the top. That made them stop talking to each other because they got in such a great fight. Pointless arguments. Pointless. I think we could all get up here and share probably very funny, maybe some disheartening stories of pointless arguments we've had in our lives. But there is no argument more pointless, more futile than to go up to God and say, to a good God, and say, you have done something wrong. That is a pointless argument. That is exactly what Jonah spends this chapter doing. 
getting into a pointless argument. Last week, we saw how five words from God led an entire city of Nineveh to fall onto its knees and repent and receive God's mercy. But instead of making Jonah dance around, instead of sending him from corner to corner in the city, telling them more about God, this displeases Jonah. This sends him into a spiral, and he accuses God of doing the wrong thing, of doing a bad thing. He essentially, the way he's acting here is that he puts God on trial. And that's what we do as, as humans. We put God on trial so very often that we think we have this moral superiority to even a God in heaven, that we can tell God what he has done right and what he has done wrong. And here that's what Jonah does. He musters up an argument against God as the prosecution, and then God responds as the defense. So we're going to look at these two sides. We're going to see what Jonah comes up with and how we're a lot like Jonah in our lives. And then how God responds to that. And in effect, how God responds to us. When we point a finger at heaven and we say, God, you're doing it wrong. So let's look at that today. Let's see how Jonah accuses God. So even as this citywide revival is taking place, chapter 4, verse 1, tells us that Jonah stomps out of there without another word, and he is just in the worst of attitudes. He is very angry. He judges God. He judges, judges his situation. He says, it's very wrong. But if actually you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew language here says that Jonah looked at this situation and said it was a great evil to him. That's a literal translation. That it was a great evil to him. That he had judged all of this that had just happened and he found it to be a great evil. There's no language the Bible could use to stress even more how greatly displeased Jonah was at the turn of events here. I like to think of it that he saw red. Do you know what that, that is? Do you ever see red in your... It's when you get so angry that you can actually hear your blood pounding in your ears and your vision actually starts clouding over and your body starts shaking and that rational point in your mind just switches off. And that's when you're seeing red. And there's a, there's a phrase that said um, where anger is one letter away from danger. And that's because when you are seeing red, you're so very close to acting in your anger and to doing things you definitely will regret later on. And that's what's happening here. He's seeing red. He's shaking in righteous anger at what just has happened. And he's spitting mad. And he says this is the worst thing that could have possibly happened. Well, Jonah doesn't count to ten. He doesn't take a few deep calming breaths. He doesn't schedule a weekend spa resort at the Dead Sea there. He doesn't do any of that. But instead, he acts in his anger. And he takes action, and in his anger, he points a finger to the heavens. He says, God, you done messed up. You did a thing really badly. And I'm very upset at what you did. He scolds God. We remember when the disciples in the Gospels scold Jesus and how often that goes not well at all for them? Well, prophets did that too. He scolds God because his emotions are driving the car. And if nothing else in chapter 4, we're going to see that Jonah is an emotional kind of guy. And he acts on his emotions. He lives according to his emotions. And that is very uh, relative to how we live today. It's very relatable. This is how our society is. We're an emotional society. We judge things based on our emotions. After all, people tell you, if you're happy doing something, it must be good that you're doing it. Do whatever makes you happy. Therefore, it is a good thing you're doing. It's making you happy. But if you're outraged about something, it must be wrong. So that's how our society says, you know, your emotions are the judge of situations. What's the problem with that? Well, we're very emotional people. In one moment, moment we could be super happy, one we could be super upset. And if we're always changing, changing our judgment based on our emotions, well, that's so turbulent, you might as well not be judging things at all. 
Jonah's irrational emotional state was the worst possible judge of what just had happened. Yet he lets that judge what had just happened. Now, if you're ever confused why Jonah's upset, he lays right out in verse 2. He says, this is my case. This is the evidence why this was wrong. And this is his argument. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, but he says to God, isn't this what I just said back in Israel? It's like a married couple. Isn't that what I just told you last week? I said this would happen, and it did. He's doing a whole I told you so to God. This is exactly the sort of outcome I was afraid of. That's why I was right, God, to go flee to Tarshish. He's basically excusing his past behavior here. He says, I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love. You're a God who relents from sending doom. How dare you? That's Jonah's argument. It is the funniest thing I've ever read in the entire Bible. I love this because there's so much irony in this verse that I'm surprised Jonah doesn't collapse under the sheer weight of it. First of all, you have a prophet of God who goes into an enemy city, proclaims five mere words. The, remember, that was the all-time record for the shortest pro, uh, prophetic proclamation ever. Five words, and the entire city, boom, they're on their knees, confessing their sin to God, repenting. Five words, and he is upset at this. The prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel are rolling around in their graves going, we would have killed to have the cities of Israel respond to us when we went in. And they ignored us day after day, year after year, as we spilled countless words of prophetic utterances to them. You said five words, you had an entire 120,000 people, boom, repent. We would have killed for that. But it's doubly ironic here that Jonah is this upset over the situation because how long ago was it, just a little over a chapter ago, that Jonah himself received grace and mercy and compassion when he did not deserve it. I told you to remember that. I told you to remember his gratefulness when he's in the stomach of the, the beast and he's praying to God and he's singing this song of salvation, of mercy, of gratitude. It's just his attitude was so great then. So remember that because it's not going to last long. And here's where it doesn't last. See, Jonah had no problem with God being these things. Let's, let's, get, let's get this accurate right here that he's accusing God of being four things. God of being compassionate, graceful, loving, merciful. These are the things he accuses God of being. When I hear contemporary culture accuse God of being things, it's never of being too compassionate and too loving. But when you understand God a little bit better, that's all you can do is point to the truth. So he points to the truth. Here. And Jonah says, well, I've had no problem with you being these things back when I was in Israel, when we had an evil king, yet you still blessed us. You still blessed the people. I had no problem when we were in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and you gave me all of these qualities. I had no problem that you were a compassionate God then. But I have a problem now, God, that we're in the middle of my enemies, the middle of people I have hated my entire life, People who are not Israelites, people do not worship you, do not know your word, and they are repenting, and they're getting your compassion too. I have a problem with that. Brings a little bit to mind the parable of the unmerciful servant, doesn't it? That Jesus would tell centuries later of how a servant, when he owed the king a lot, and the king called in that debt, and the, the servant threw himself down on the king's mercy, and the king forgave that debt. Well, the servant turned around to another fellow servant who owed him a little bit of money and did not show a lick of mercy. Jonah is being that servant in this moment. He's been shown great mercy, will not turn around and show the same love and mercy to others because he considers them his enemies. Now, if you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian, I really like that New Testament God a little bit more than the Old Testament one. The Old Testament one tends to be really harsh and mean, and he's always doing the plague thing. I don't really like that so much. So I'm a, I'm a New Testament Christian. 
Because in the New Testament, Jesus is nice and he's rainbows and he's love and he's mercy and he's a big cuddle bear. Uh, that is a very superficial understanding of the Bible. And Jonah right here would like to correct you of your misunderstanding or, or anybody who says that. Because Jonah is, wants God to, to bring down that hammer. He wants God to press that smite button on his keyboard up there in heaven so hard on the city of Nineveh. And instead, Jonah says, you showed them mercy. You showed them grace because this is just like you. This is just like how you are. You see, we got to get out of this mentality that there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, and the old one's all about wrath and judgment, and the new one's all about grace and mercy. They're the same God. They're the same God always and forever. And Jonah knew this as his prophet. He knew that God was like this. He could not, even in his anger, point a finger to God and say, you're a mean God. He could not point a finger to God and say, you're an unjust God. The worst accusation he could say is, you're just way too merciful. You're too compassionate. You've crossed the line. You need to keep that mercy and compassion where it belongs, which is right around me, in my orbit, and not out there with those filthy, unwashed pagans. That's all he could do with a straight face. God is just God. He is just. He is justice, but he is also mercy. He is wrath, but he is also forgiveness. And we need to grow and understand that he can be both of these things and was always and will always be. Well, on top of Jonah becoming emotionally upset and accusing God of not acting the right way, the final linchpin of Jonah's great case against God here is to scrunch up his face, throw himself on the ground, and do a little kicky-kicky on the ground. It's what I call a temper tantrum, a hissy fit. This is what he's doing right here as we're seeing him scream up at heaven, pounding the ground, saying, God, just kill me. I am so angry about this situation. I'm better off dying than living in a world where you're this nice. <laughs> this is why I love this chapter so much. <laughs> I mean, literally, that's what he's doing. He's so emotionally over the top. He just, like, the worst, he's, I, I can't live in this world anymore. God, just kill me. I mean, if you're not going to smite them, smite me. Just get it over with already. I don't want to live in such a wonderful world where you're so graceful. Before, obviously, we see, I don't even have to point out to you how weak of an argument this is on Jonah's case that he really isn't building any, up anything substantial. And before we move on to see God's response, I want to point out that's often us. When we are, have a problem with how God is acting or not acting in a way that we want him to, usually we're just like Jonah, where we get emotional, we make irrational arguments, and then we just throw a bit of a hissy fit. God, I'm not talking to you anymore. You're, you made me mad. I'm just not going to church for the next four Sundays. See how you like that, right? <laughs> Pastor Justin's just going to have to deal with that. Well, you know what? God looks at you, and he loves you, and he calls you to repent. But he needs you to know that when we get upset like this, when we have a problem with how God is acting, how God acts in the world, how God's acting in our lives, it's very dangerous for us because it makes us get very close to a point where we can easily slip into sin. And as funny as I think Jonah's being here, he's also being incredibly sinful. He is pointing a finger at God, a good God, and saying you have done a sinful thing. God cannot sin. God does not sin. Remember how people accused Jesus of being in league with demons and how blasphemous that was? We cannot point a finger at God, brothers and sisters, and say you have done wrong. We may not understand it. We may not emotionally like it. We may struggle mightily with how God works. I'm not, I don't want to say that this is all very easy and we should just skip out of here on Sunday mornings and go, God's perfect and that, that makes anything that happened you know, no, trivial to us. Sometimes things are very deep. The, the wounds go deep in our life when God takes somebody away. 
when God gives us an affliction or a calamity, when we're just struggling with something, we're going, God, why don't you do better? Why don't you, why don't you fill every seat in this church next Sunday? That's a, that's a prayer I pray every week. Why haven't you done that? You know, why can't you do I know he can. I, know, I don't know why, but I'm going to pray for it. But I've got to be very careful. I'm not going to cross over that line and say, you haven't done it yet, therefore you're doing wrong. Just be careful in your emotional state not to sin. That's what I'm saying. All right. Well, just in case you were holding your verse after verse, or holding your breath after verse 3, you think, well, Jonah's going to get it now. He's kicking his feet. He's pointing at God. He's opening himself up. You God kill me. Well, God does not kill him. You can breathe easy. Even though he has crossed a very serious line here, that he's accused God, it's the same slow to anger, abounding in love attitude that God rebounds and shows to Jonah. And this is really beautiful. We see how God treats a sinner, a sinner who is in his fold, but a sinner nonetheless. So instead of punishing Jonah, which he could deserve in this moment, God does something very different. God uses the situation to teach Jonah, to have a little bit of a learning opportunity, to, to sit him down and say, I want to teach you through what you're going through right now. There was an ancient poet named Rumi who once said, Raise your words, not your voice. It is the rain that grows flowers, not thunder. Raise your words, not your voice. It is the rain that grows flowers, not thunder. I love the truth of that statement. Because right here, Jonah is all thunder. He is all emotion. He is spitting mad. He is angry. He is venting his emotions all over, spewing it all over the place. But that doesn't really grow truth. It doesn't grow understanding. But in return, God's teaching falls upon him like gentle rain. Deuteronomy 32, too, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. God says this, May my teaching drop as rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, like showers upon the herb. We have been going through this spring, many, I love just when we have a good rain shower. We've had a lot of them. And when that happens, I like to open up the window. I like to listen to the rain coming down. Yeah, sometimes you can hear the thunder and that's scary, but the thunder doesn't make everything grow. Irene was telling me how much her flower beds and her garden has been growing because we've gotten so much rain and so much sunshine. And here God says, this is how I teach you. I don't teach you by opening up a fire hose into your face and just blasting you across the room. My teaching comes upon you like gentle rain that saturates into your life, that pours, it gets everywhere, and then helps you to grow. And it's this idea that it just comes down, and before you know it, God's teaching has transformed you. It's one of the biggest reasons why God has given you the Bible. He has given you his teaching in a very gentle way. He's not coming up and shouting in your ears or pinning you down to the floor and screaming into your face. He has given you a book that you can open up and read his gentle teaching every single day. And he wants you, as you're doing this, the, one of the biggest points of the Bible is to help you understand why God does what he does who God is. He wants you to understand and start seeing things through his eyes. We are at a disadvantage here in this world because we see things through our eyes, our sinner's eyes. And when you see things through a sinner's eyes, well, you judge things according to a sinner's eyes. You judge things emotionally and wrongly. And God says, I want, I want you to start adjusting your vision. My son just got glasses for the first time. And he looks incredible in them. But I, I went with him to the eye doctor. And they went through that whole adjusting process, right? Where they put that big weird mask over your face. And started, well, what's better? One or two? One or two? You know? Until you get crystal clear vision. And that's the Bible for us. That God is adjusting your vision. Until you can start seeing things more and more and more His way. And less and less and less your limited perception that you have now. So this is what God wants to do for Jonah right here. 
as he wants to fall upon him like gentle rain, he wants to start adjusting his vision so that Jonah can see this particular situation through God's eyes, not through his eyes. We know how Jonah sees the situation. We've gotten all that. Let's see God's way of, of teaching this. God uses two teaching methods. He's a great teacher. The first way, way he uses is a pedagogical method of asking questions. He as, asks questions of Jonah, three separate questions. You ask, as a teacher to a student, you ask questions, not because you don't know the answer, but you want them to start thinking about it. What do you think about this? Why do you think this situation? It gets the wheels turning. And the first question God asks of Jonah, he says, is, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, stop your mouth just for a moment. Is it right in this situation, right here and right now, for you to be angry? Sometimes it is right for us to be angry. When we see an injustice being done in the world, it is right for us to be angry. When we see how pervasive sin is and how it destroys lives, we see how Satan is working in this world to take people and try to pull them away from their Savior. It is right to be angry. But in this situation, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? What does Jonah respond to that, by the way? Nothing. He doesn't. There's no... Because he's like, if he responds, he has to tell the truth, right? And he's not going to tell the truth. Well, as, as Jonah's mulling that question over, God turns to his sech, second teaching method, which is the object lesson. I love object lessons because they're cool, because you can see something, you can wrap your mind around an idea when you see an object or you see something. Uh, in, in college, uh, one of my favorite classes was a phys physics class because our physics professor was always doing object lessons. And one day he came in, he sat down on a, a skateboard, he put on a football helmet, you always know something's going to be good when he puts on a football helmet, and then he took a fire extinguisher and he blasted it in one direction and he went the other direction. He showed, you know, Newton's law of the equal and opposite reactions, right? He could have just told us that, but I have now and forever always remember it because of an object lesson. Well, God comes in to this situation and provides an object lesson. I like God's a little sneaky here. He gets, he, Jonah is stomped out of the city. He goes a little ways. He builds a shelter, but it's not a perfect shelter because out in the desert, not a lot of building materials. And Jonah's still sitting there sweating, crossing his arms, hoping that Nineveh is going to slip up and that God will decide he'll smite them anyways. And as he's sitting there, God, as he's been doing throughout this entire book, commands nature once more. How does he command nature? He makes a plant grow. Okay, I know, that's not as tremendous as a storm or a giant whale swallowing a guy, but it's still, I can't make a small plant grow to a giant leafy thing overnight. I'm not, I, I can kill plants really quickly. That's, that's my talent. I can't make them grow that fast. God commands this one plant. That's the amount, that, that's the control he has over nature. He can do a big storm, but he can also do a little plant. And he makes this plant grow, and it grows. And then we see this emotional pendulum that Jonah goes in verse 1 of being super angry, and by verse 6, what? He's goofy and he's happy. He's so happy. He's happy in that like childlike little way because now he has a big umbrella over his head. That's what makes Jonah happy. Sometimes it's a small thing, right? It's the small thing that puts you in a good mood. It's getting that perfect cup of brewed coffee from the, the drive-thru. They almost never get my coffee right. Sometimes it's burnt, sometimes it's got a little too much, but once in a while they get it just right and that will, that'll make my morning just great. Sometimes it's wearing an outfit that you think just flatters you and you feel really good about that. Or maybe you get a compliment from a stranger or it's a beautiful day outside. And you can just get that perfect weather day where it's not too hot, not too cold, and you're just like, oh, I could just do an eternity of days like this. A small thing that puts you in a good mood. There again, got to be very careful that your emotions judge how you relate to God. Because on days like that where a small thing puts you in a good mood, I might go, well, God's smiling on me today. God must really like me today. 
And God's going up there like, what, I don't like you on the days where bad stuff happens? Am I any less good to you on the days where you're going through a crisis? No. God is always good all the time. We've got to be very careful that our emotions don't judge him in those situations. But for Jonah, this plant becomes his new best friend. He calls it leafy. I know it doesn't say there in your translation. Uh, mine does. He calls his plant leafy. He spends a whole day talking to it. He, he curls up under it and gets a really good afternoon nap. Oh, it's very comfortable. As the stars come up at night, he tells Leafy a bedtime story of Jack and the Beanstalk. It's like, yes, keep on growing, Leafy. One day you will be that great and that wonderful. And he, jo Jonah goes to sleep that night. And he dreams of the next day where he's going to spend another wonderful day with his new best friend. And then he wakes up in the morning and, ah, Leafy's dead. He's dead because God has commanded another small thing in nature, a worm, the very hungry little caterpillar, to go and chew its way right through Leafy and kill him on the spot. And on top of that, well, God just pulls out all the stops. He sends a horribly hot east wind. In Iran, they know this wind, they call it Sracho. There are horrible winds that come right off the mountain. And they're so hot, it's like being sticking your head into an oven that is blasting at full blast. And it could be so hot and so intense that it causes disorientation and faintness and unconsciousness. And so Jonah's getting a face full of that, and the sun's beating down on his head, and Jonah now goes from being happy the day before to being angry and, su and sort of suicidal again in this verse. And so we see that emotional roller coaster. But this time, God calls him out on his irrational anger. He calls him out on his behavior. He said, Jonah, you are angry over a plant you did not make, you did not deserve. And he, you got so superficially attached to Leafy there that when I took him away from you, you got angry because of it. You had no right to be angry. And then God, man, he comes in for that knockout blow, right? He comes in, he's been building up this object lesson. He's been building up all, the, all this in chapter 4 to this one moment where he comes into Jonah and he says, Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the right hand from their left? Jonah, you got so attached to a plant you knew for 12 hours that you named it, which was kind of weird, Jonah, but I'm going to let that pass. And you fell in love with it, and now you're throwing a fit over the fact it's gone. You got so attached over a plant you didn't even make. How attached do you think I am? Over 120,000 people I made, and I love, and I want to see redeemed. How dare you say that I should have killed them? And with that, the book of Jonah comes to a close. I always thought it ended on a cliffhanger. And in a way, it kind of does. Because we want to see what Jonah re says in response. But really, when you think about it, what does it matter? Jonah responded the right way, wrong way. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. This is the point of the book. Down to this one last question. Should I not be concerned for these people? This book ends us by inviting Jonah, by inviting all of us to see humanity, to adjust our vision so that we're no longer seeing the people around us, the cultures around us, the world around us through our own eyes that are flawed with our emotions and our biases, but instead to see it through God's eyes. See that people are made fearfully and wonderfully by Him. And because they're made in the image of God, they have a worth to God. And that is great. And they have dignity. That's why this Old Testament God is the exact same as the New Testament God, because we've seen this all over again. You see this in the Gospel of Mark that we went through a while back. When Jesus goes across the Sea of Galilee, and he sees a crowd waiting for them, and it says in Mark 6 that Jesus had compassion upon them because they were like sheep lost without a shepherd. And he got to the shore, he steps out of the boat, and the Bible says then he began to teach them. His gentle teaching coming down like rain on their lives. 
a shepherd giving the sheep what they need. Same God. Sure, I think we can understand a little bit of Jonah's perspective. We have to admit that the people of Nineveh, they are not lily white. They are not innocent. They have committed great atrocities. The greatest of all, which is that they did not worship God. And they broke the first commandment over and over again. They were not innocent. They were in deserving of judgment, the way all of us are. But as Paul says in Romans 9, God has mercy and compassion upon those whom he pleases. That is God's sovereign right as Lord and King of the universe to say, I want to have mercy and compassion upon this person. It is his also his right as judge to judge all. But in his loving mercy, he selects some to show that grace and compassion to. And in the book of Jonah, we've seen that he already has shown great mercy and compassion upon the sailors and upon Jonah and upon the 120,000 people of Nineveh. That is his right. And today, the same mercy, the same compassion comes upon anyone who falls to their knees and pro professes that Jesus Christ is Lord and ask Jesus to be the Savior of their heart. They get the same mercy and compassion of a God who is abounding in love. And He is so slow to deliver judgment that He's willing to wait to the last day of your life to do it so that you have every opportunity to repent. Well, we don't know what happened to Jonah after this book. In a way, it is a cliffhanger. We don't know what happened to this prophet. I, I can speculate, I can wish, but it doesn't really matter. But we do know what happened to Nineveh. We know that a hundred years later, the whole city slid back into great evil. We know this because God sent another prophet, a prophet named Nahum, in that book that you've never opened, you've never read in your life, but it's there in the Bible. And if you open up, you realize it's a sequel to Jonah. That a hundred years later, Nahum is sent by God to the city to pronounce once again judgment for their sins. But this time, Nineveh does not repent. The king does not put sackcloth and ashes and sits down in the dust. They do not call upon God to save them. And in 612 B.C., Nineveh was destroyed, that they saw judgment. But the book of Jonah isn't really a story about a city. It's not really a story about a big whale or a grumpy prophet. It is an account of God's character. This is the point of the book. Jonah ends here on a question in verse 11. By the way, Jonah and Nahum, the only two books in the Bible that end on a question. And Jonah ends on a question because he's basically, the author is handing us this question and saying, here, chew on this. Should God have mercy and compassion upon people he wants to have mercy and compassion upon? Chew on God's mercy, the depths of that, what it means to your life, that you look back at the, the lake, the lake superior of your sins, the depths of your sins, and said, and yet God had grace and mercy and compassion upon me. And then also the follow-up to that question, should you not start seeing other people the way God sees them? That you should not start seeing other people that they are made in the image of God, that God loves them too, that they are in the need of having the gospel proclaimed to them just as you were. That they need to have forgiveness in their lives just like you had it. This is the question that Jonah puts in our lap and walks away, leaving us with a very heavy question indeed. But take it, wrestle with it, learn from it, grow from it. This is God's gentle teaching coming down into your life like rain. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we can laugh at this prophet. We can groan at him. We can get frustrated with him. But I think we can also relate very greatly to Jonah and to his sins and to his attitude. Maybe it's just a good example of what we should not be, Lord that we should not be so unforgiving and so unmerciful that we think that only certain people should be allowed in the church. Only certain people are worth sharing the gospel to. Lord, there's, you've commanded us to go into all the world, all, underline all, Lord. 
all the world and give them love and mercy and grace and continually point them to the Savior that can give them that living water that will fill them up and satisfy them forever. Lord, you had compassion upon 120,000 people in Nineveh. Have compassion upon us. Have compassion upon the people of Buffalo. I don't know how many people passed away yesterday, Lord, in this city alone. But I know too many of them, too many of them, did not fall upon your mercy. Lord, may not another day go where people are not committing their lives to you. I just pray for a revival. Pray that this city would fall on its knees. Pray that it would ripple out and that people would see that Christ and Christ alone, that's where our hope is found. In your name, amen. And now from 2 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go with God. Go with your Father this week. Proclaim the word in your actions and your deeds. Amen.